What's up guys, welcome back to Paul's Hardware. I have a bunch of computer parts here in front of me, which means it's time for yet another monthly build, this time for November 2019. And if you're considering building a new gaming PC this holiday season, and maybe taking advantage of some of those Black Friday sales, and you're planning to spend around $800 to $1,000, this is the computer you should build. Excellent! The Hydro X series is Corsair's new line of custom cooling parts built for the world's most powerful and stunning systems. They've gone all out with CPU and graphics card water blocks, pump reservoir combos, fittings, tubing, radiators, and coolant, providing you with everything you need to build a spectacular custom cooling loop that lowers system temperatures and improves performance, complete with vivid RGB lighting. Click the sponsor link in the video description to learn more. So every month I part out a couple builds at the beginning of the month and then I build one of them and at the beginning of this month my parts list was an $850 PC that feels like a $1000 PC and I chose the core components for this build based on that. So I'm going to go over the parts that I chose and why I chose them and maybe offer some alternatives here and there for some parts that could be swapped in for a little bit more money and more performance or a little bit less money and typically less performance. And just so you guys know I'm not doing a step-by-step -step tutorial in this video but I do have a step-by-step -step how to build a PC guide that you can check out by clicking the card up there if you want to, and then you can apply all of that knowledge to this particular build itself. I will be pointing out specific quirks or eccentricities or things that I come across as I put this together. That said, let's go over the parts. So I've kind of rearranged things here, and that is so I can go over these in order for those of you who maybe are less familiar with PC building from the parts that are most impactful on your overall computer's performance to the least impactful. And we'll start from left and go to the right as we go over each of these, starting with the processor, of course, which is an AMD Ryzen 5 3600X. The reason I'm going with AMD is I simply think that they have the best mainstream platform on offer right now. Really fast processors that go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Intel. Note that this is a 6-core 12-thread processor. It does have SMT or simultaneous multi-threading. That's called hyper-threading on the Intel side, and it's something that you typically have to pay more money for. So if you want 6 cores and 12 threads, and you're buying the Intel mainstream platform, and you want it to be unlocked for overclocking like all of these AMD processors are, you typically have to spend upwards of $300. Whereas the 3600X is listed for $250, regularly on sale for $230, and I just saw it on sale for $200. So keep an eye on the 3600 as well. It's just a little bit lower clocked, but still has 6 cores and 12 threads, and it is unlocked for overclocking. You get a slightly larger cooler with the 3600X that's going to do a little bit better job. All in all, though, for $200, the 3600X is a really, really good deal, and it will last you for quite a while. The other nice thing about investing in this platform is these processors are socket AM4. So the motherboards that you're going to use with them are socket AM4, and you're probably going to go with a 400 series motherboard like a B450, and then they also have 500 series motherboards like X570 that's available, although X570 motherboards typically cost closer to $200 and up, whereas you can get a good B450 motherboard like the Tomahawk Max here from MSI for around $110, $215. Getting ahead of myself though, having a nice fast CPU is going to be mostly helpful for doing stuff like video editing and video transcoding and rendering stuff, typically referred to as CPU heavy lifting tasks. And if you're just doing web browsing or even gaming, CPU is actually a little bit less of the equation and the GPU comes into play a little bit more so. The card I'm building with today is an AMD Radeon RX 50 700 XT, and this is the Gaming X version that MSI makes. In the parts list, I recommended a Radeon RX 5700, which you can sometimes find for about $300. 5700 XTs typically start at about $350 to $400. That said, once again, there are two reasons I've included this card. One, MSI provided it to me, so that's nice. Two, this entire system is going to be given away uh, along with our charity live stream in a couple weeks, so uh, the winner of that shouldn't complain about getting a 5700 XT instead of a 5700. And finally, there's lots of options over on the NVIDIA side as well for graphics cards that shouldn't be ignored because they're also quite good. I just feel like down in the 300 to $350 price range, the 5700 and 5700 XT have a little bit of an edge, but if you can find a good deal on a 2060 Super and up, go for that, and if you're spending more money, obviously, you have options there in the 2070 Super, 2080 Super, and 2080 Ti. In particular, I would recommend an NVIDIA GPU if you already have a G-Sync variable refresh rate monitor, for example. If you go AMD, you're going to need to get a FreeSync variable refresh rate monitor. All that said, I do not blame you if you're confused in your choice of GPU. Just know that the 5700 and 5700 XT, as long as you're getting the less expensive versions of those, are good choices. And I will be doing some Black Friday deals videos where I will be pulling out graphics cards that I think are great bargains, and so stay tuned for that if you want to find some deals actually come Black Friday. Now the rest of the parts are going to have an impact, but a, less, a lesser impact on the overall system performance. 
For instance, your storage, you're gonna wanna get an SSD and the faster SSD can give you a little bit more performance in certain areas. That said, once you've got an SSD, the improvement that you get by going with a faster SSD for typical day-to-day -day compute tasks is pretty minimal. I'm recommending a 500 gig class SATA SSD. Today, that means the OCZ VX500, which is made by Toshiba, which I don't think is actually still produced, but it's a, it's a good solid SSD and it's a 512 gig drive. You can find 500 gig SATA SSDs for around $45 right now, which is a good deal. Keep an eye on the one terabyte ones as well, which you can sometimes find for around 80 to 100. And that said, also reality check if you're looking at SATA SSDs, the 2.5 inch ones like this that have a SATA plug, you also have the option to go with an NVMe SSD like this one. They have an M.2 interface, a little one like that. They just plug directly into your motherboard, which is convenient. And whereas these have a range of speeds from like a thousand megabytes per second read and writes all the way up to 3000 megabytes per second read and writes up or, or above, drives like this Intel 660p series SSD will give you significantly faster performance compared to a SATA drive. And you can often find them for only five to 10 bucks more. So that is something you should reality check in case you want to go with a little bit faster storage. I again kind of got out of order though because uh, storage will affect your boot times and your load times for games, but uh, your memory is actually going to have more of an overall impact on your overall system performance, especially if you're going to get slightly faster memory to pair up with a Ryzen CPU like the 3600X. For the 3000 series of Ryzen CPUs, AMD is recommending 3600 speed memory. So today I have this G-Skill Ripjaws 5 kit, which I purchased from Newegg. It is DDR4 3600 rated cast latency 16, and the capacity is 16 gigs. The capacity is actually one of the base specs you should be looking at. 16 gigabytes, eight gigs per stick. You want a dual channel kit like this so you can take advantage of dual channel memory mode. And with most motherboards that are full-size ATX like this, you'll have four memory slots. So that means you'll only be populating two of them and that means you can upgrade and add more memory in the future if you decide that you need it. Now, one of the confusing things about choosing memory for the Ryzen platform is that Ryzen processors like faster memory. It affects the overall performance of the chip, but getting really fast memory that's actually listed as compatible with Ryzen can often be more expensive. Like this kit here was about $75. Comparable kits that are like from G-Skills Flare X line that are made specifically for Ryzen can be 20 to 30 to 40 dollars more expensive. And all we're talking about here is that the actual memory chips, the little chips that are on each memory module itself, might be from a different source. The ones that are pretty much universally compatible are known as Samsung B dies, and to get to that guaranteed, you typically have to spend more money. So I went with this kit uh, because it's less expensive. I'm gonna plug it in and test it and see if we can actually run it at the rated speeds. Based on the reviews I saw of this kit, which were, just, were just a few of, because it is a relatively new kit uh, that may or may not actually happen. Uh, but the other thing to consider, I guess, if you're looking at memory, is that a lot of memory can have flashy like RGB LEDs and stuff on it like that. That doesn't affect performance. It doesn't make it faster, so uh, if it's less expensive, go with a simpler kit like one of these. It's just got a nice simple black heat spreader design on it, and hopefully by the end of this video you will know for sure whether or not this kit is plug-and-play compatible at the rated 3600 speed with a 3600X. Rounding things out, here's our motherboard, the MSI B450 Tomahawk Max. If you go with the B450 motherboard and 7X570 motherboard, the upside is that they're a lot less expensive. This board sells for about $115 right now, whereas the good entry-level X570 motherboards, and if you are looking at that, I'd recommend the uh, Asus Tough X570, by the way, but those usually start at uh, $180 to $200 each. This gets you all of the same performance of that. This gets you some decent overclocking performance. You could upgrade this from your six core here to the 12 core 3900X or even the 16 core 3950X and it works just fine at full speeds in this motherboard. The fact that this is a max version means that it is updated so it will work plug and play with your Ryzen 3000 series processors whereas the older non-max version of the B450 Tomahawk did need a BIOS update in order to recognize the Ryzen 3000 series CPUs. It is lacking Wi-Fi so keep that in mind you might want to add on a USB Wi-Fi adapter if you need Wi-Fi. It does have Ethernet so you can plug in directly and then with B450 you're not going to have access to PCI Express Gen 4. You'll be limited to Gen 3 speeds, which for the majority of gamers is totally, totally fine. You only really need PCI Express Gen 4 if you're going for a really, really fast NVMe SSD. Not this one but really, really fast NVMe SSDs. And those can be really, really expensive and they're not gonna improve your gaming performance. So that's why you can 
pretty much leave that out and you're fine with B450. The last things we have here are a power supply and a case, and these are going to maybe minimally impact your performance. For a case, you wanna make sure you have airflow, and that's why I chose the Meshify C, which is currently selling for $90. I have a couple other recommendations for cases that are about $70. The NZXT H510, as well as the Fantex P350X are really good choices. I couldn't source those quickly enough for today's video, so I went with the Meshify C. It comes with an intake and exhaust fan, which is nice. Really well-rated case, and one that I've built in before, and I think uh, anyone would be happy with. That said, you know, there are a couple options that might be 15 or 20 bucks cheaper, but I have seen the Meshify C go on sale as well. So keep an eye out for it this Black Friday. Finally, we need a power supply. For that, I'm using the Cooler Master MWE Gold 650. This has several really nice features. For one, it's 80 plus gold rated, which means it's just gonna be efficient. It's gonna draw less power from the wall to run your system. It has a five-year warranty, which is nice, but more important than that, it's fully modular, so you only plug in the cables that you need. And then also, very importantly, the cables that are included are all black. There's no hideous colors that is gonna stand out and make your build not look as pretty. We want something that blends in. If you're trying to pick a power supply, and this one is a little bit expensive for you because power supply prices have gone up a lot as a result of the tariffs in the US recently, here's how I would go about picking one. First off, you wanna make sure it's 80 plus rated. I'd recommend 80 plus bronze if you can't claw your way up to 80 plus gold. Second, it's good to buy from a reputable power supply manufacturer. Cooler Master, I would say, is definitely one of those, but there's also other options like Seasonic, Corsair, EVGA. You can double check reviews, that'll give you a good idea of which companies make good power supplies. And then lastly, if you can go for modular, go for modular. There's also partially modular where the 24 pin is permanently connected, but the other ones are modular. Modular cables is really nice. It just means you're gonna have less cable cutter, clutter in your system. You only plug in the modular cables that you need. That said, getting all those features can often cost 90 or $100. So I don't blame anyone for getting a $50 80 plus bronze rated 550 watt power supply with no modular cables as long as the cables are still black that's still just fine 550 watts will get you by for the vast majority of gaming pc builds right now 650 watts gives you a little bit more flexibility for upgrading a graphics card in the future and then it also means that the power supply is going to op be operating at a more optimal point in its efficiency curve but again if you're at all concerned then feel free to double check my monthly builds playlists for some parts lists descriptions or double check my channel because I will have some videos coming out around Black Friday that have suggestions, recommendations, as well as my picks for some really good deals this Black Friday season. Let's talk about some of the reasons why I chose this case, and they could be reasons that apply to other cases as well. Uh, case can often be your biggest impact when it comes to your aesthetic choice for what your system is going to look like. So most cases are, you know, a standard tower style design. It's basically a big box, but there are certain things that can be done aesthetically to make it stand out a little bit. And Fractal, uh, to make this mesh front panel stand out, has given it sort of this textured fractally design, which, which is cool. More functionally though, that acts as a big old dust filter and there's also a magnetic dust filter up here on top. Dust filters can actually reduce the airflow in a case, but it does prevent dust from building up. So it's a bit of a trade off there. I prefer to have dust filters rather than not. Other than that, you might wanna take a look at your IO in the front, inputs and outputs. Usually you'll have at least a couple USB 3.0 ports. That's pretty standard right now. Power and reset, of course, and a mic and headphone jack. If you have a USB 3.1 type C port up here as well, that's also convenient, but you will need to pass that back and plug it into your motherboard. This motherboard doesn't have that header on it. That's one of the reasons it's a more entry level board. So uh, we're not gonna be missing out on anything there. We also have a tempered glass side panel and tempered glass is really nice because because it's a lot more durable, it's not gonna get scratched up like plexiglass, and it gives you a nice view inside your case. I have left the plastic protective peel on this for now because it's best to do that while you're building and then peel it off once the system is put together. I also like how this tempered glass mounts. It's got little plugs that it sort of sits on and then you can screw the screws in or remove them. That's not the absolute best mounting method for a tempered glass side panel, but it's definitely easier than some of the other ones I've seen where they just rest on the screws until you remove them out, and that can be a little precarious. Internally, we have a nice painted interior. Everything is all black, so everything's gonna match pretty nicely. And then if we add some RGB lighting or something like that, it'll stand out. And that will be uh, how we color and make our case more unique. Your case will often come with fans pre-installed and some inexpensive cases come with really not good fans installed, but these that Fractal ships with it by default are actually pretty nice. So uh, we can go ahead and stick with these. A basement area that's down at the bottom of the case where your power supply will go that sort of tucks it away and hides it is also nice to have, especially if your power supply 
isn't as aesthetically pleasing to look at. Fractal also added some ventilation here. So uh, we're gonna have our fan on the bottom for our power supply, but this does give you the option to point it up if you decided you wanted to do that. There's also a dust filter across the entire bottom of the case. So this is going to protect the dust intake for your power supply, which sits back here. You also have the option maybe to add another fan here, but uh, I haven't really done that personally. But the nice thing is you remove it from the front, so you don't need to move your case around too much. You just pull it there, it slides all the way out from the front so you can pull it out and clean it and put it back in without having to redo your setup or get back behind the case somehow. Finally, for your case choice, you should uh, try to take a look at your cable management area. Usually that's back behind the motherboard tray. Fractal has put a triple mount here for 2.5 inch drives. So that's nice for drive expansion. There's also some 3.5 inch mounts down in the bottom so you can add mechanical drives if you still have some of those hang hanging around. There's this real nice channel down the side here that has Velcro strips that are pre-attached. So all the cables are sort of pre-routed through there, but as you're gonna be adding more from the power supply, you can route them through there. You can cinch those cables down and get your cable management nice and tidy. That's also what all these little tie down points are for. Just routing through zip ties or twist ties or Velcro and strapping down your cables to keep them clean and tidy and out of the way as best you can. Another nice bonus from this case is that everywhere there are pass-throughs like here and here and here, you have these grommeted holes so you can pass the cables through and that's that's just real nice to have as well and Fractal does a good job with these. They tend to stay on and not pop off too easily as you're shoving cables through them so that's nice too. And all these features I've been mentioning that are nice about this case are by no means unique to Fractal. There are lots of cases that are well designed like this one. This is just a good example that I think has done a lot of things right. So again, have fun with your case decision. As long as you're getting an ATX case, you should have compatibility with your motherboard and the rest of the hardware that goes in it. The only other thing I would say to deeply consider when you're choosing your case is going to be uh, how big your, your graphics card is, the length, and sometimes even the width, because the graphics card is going to go right there, and you might have conflicts down in this area, or you might even have width conflicts going out this way. Fortunately, again with this case, there is plenty of room both uh, horizontally as well as horizontally. They're both kind of horizontal, I guess. All right, I tried to do this in a recent video and it failed, uh, so I'm going to do it again here. This is the Wraith Spire, which is the air cooler that comes with a AMD Ryzen 2000 or 3000 series processor if you get a high enough end one. There's also a Wraith Stealth that I'm not showing you right now. These are both Wraith Spires. With the 3000 series of Wraith Spires, they removed this copper plug from the middle, so it's all aluminum now and the fan uh, spins at a higher RPM and it's noticeably louder. So I am going to be swapping this since the system will probably be shipped at some point. Uh, I'm not gonna put a big air cooler on there or anything. This is actually really good for shipping, uh, but I'm gonna swap it with the upgraded version from last generation that has copper and there should be enough vertical clearance this time. One thing that would be nice in this case is if, is if the standoffs came pre-installed. They do not, they're in a little baggy. That's okay, but it does mean we'll need to install them while keeping track of which ones line up with the motherboard itself. Again, this is covered in my tutorial where I go step-by-step step how to build a PC, but basically most motherboards have three across the top, three more across the middle, and three more across the bottom, and you wanna make sure that you mount a standoff wherever there is a mounting point on the motherboard. Now at this point, if you did have an NVMe SSD, you would want to install it right here. But other than that, our motherboard is pretty much all set to go and we're ready to install it in the case. I've got the standoffs mounted where they should be all along here. The thing we want to make sure we handle before we do that is one of the two things that I got out of the motherboard accessories box, and that is our IO shield. Uh, that needs to go on the back, facing out, of course. The only other thing that I got from the motherboard box was uh, a SATA cable so I could connect up our SATA SSD. And if you are new to PC building, now might be a good time to reference your motherboard's manual because you are going to want to connect up front panel connectors. On this particular motherboard there, this little block right here, it's labeled JFP1, and they have a little grid diagram right up there that tells you which is the power LED, power button, reset button, so that you can wire those up. But once we get to that point, that's gonna be really annoying and knowing where those are beforehand can be uh, helpful. 
Once the motherboard's in the case, it should rest on this little center post right there, and then you should maybe double check, reality check, that you have standoffs mounted beneath all of these standoff mounting points along here, because if you put one in the wrong spot, uh, that can actually be dangerous. So this is something that you definitely want to double check. That is our last screw. We have again, one, two, three, four, post six, seven, eight, and nine. And at this point, we're actually pretty far along with the build process. The CPU is installed with the cooler on top of it. The memory is installed on the motherboard. Motherboard is installed in the case. All we have left is to install the power supply, which is gonna go down here. Then we gotta route up the cables for the power supply to provide power to everything. Route the front panel connectors to the motherboard where they need to be and install the graphics card and SSD, and then we'll be done. Of course, we're also gonna to wanna to connect up our case fans and we have one in the front, one in the back. These have a standard uh, header for case fans, which is uh, usually either three or four pins. These are three pin, that's just fine. We have four pin headers on the motherboard like this one right here, and you can plug a three pin plug into the four pin header like I just did. There's just one extra pin out on the side. Also, here's a good time to talk about cable management. This is plugged in, it's functional, the fan's gonna spin. But I just took the cable that was already sitting there and I left it as is. Uh, let me see if I can do this better. Okay, how about now? Can you tell what I did? I took the cable, routed it straight from the plug and I kind of tucked it back in here. And I was gonna use the twist tie to tie it up right in there, but basically I just tucked it in right up here. It's not even tied to anything. See, cable just hanging out loose, back in there, tucked up under. That's not going anywhere. And the main point here is just that as you are building and putting stuff together, if you know there's a cable hanging loose, don't let it hang loose, tuck it away. If you know where it's plugged in and you know you have room. Uh, I did the same thing over here with our CPU fan. So all we have is that little bit of cable sticking out to over where it's plugged in to the header on the motherboard. And incidentally, that's the header that's specifically labeled CPU fan. And that is something that you wanna make sure you plug the CPU fan into the CPU fan one, because otherwise it will think you don't have a CPU fan that's spinning and it won't let your system boot up. I'm gonna do front panel connectors for the case next. I'm not gonna to show too much detail here, but basically there are four little ones that are individuals. These will plug into that little block of front panel connectors that I already showed you on the motherboard. I've got this one for USB 3.0 that plugs into the USB 3.0 port on the motherboard. It's There's only one that's this size. And then we have an HD audio one. Uh, this one can sometimes be confused for a USB plug. USB 2 plugs look really similar to this, but note that it is keyed. There's a blank one there that's not the same as on USB, so that makes it harder to accidentally plug into the wrong port. So it's time to get our power supply ready now. So I'm gonna plug in all the modular cables that I need. Well, it's here outside the case and the power supply mounts from the back. There's a little bracket that you remove to insert it from that side. So I've got the main 24 pin for the motherboard connected up. I'm also gonna need a supplemental power for the motherboard. This is for the CPU. Uh, typically this is gonna be a four pin or an eight pin. So I want the eight pin for that. For the graphics card, we're gonna need supplemental power since we've got a pretty beefy graphics card here. There are dual eight pin PCI Express graphics connectors. So these are blocks of eight, which is really similar to the CPU. Just bear in mind that the CPU is four and four, whereas these are six plus two, and they're keyed differently. So you really have to wedge them to get these plugged in wrong but please don't plug these in wrong. Now, fortunately, just one cable is all that's needed because there's a daisy chain on the end that has a couple of the eight pin connectors that are required for the graphics card. And then lastly, since we do have a SATA SSD, we will need a SATA power plug for that. And these usually come in sets where you get three or four plugs on the end of one cable.
So there it is guys, the system is all put together and I know I've been doing kind of a half tutorial with this video so if there's any details that I missed or things that you feel like I glossed over, definitely check out my how to build tutorial because that is more step by step and will take you through every little thing that you should need to know. One thing I definitely like about this build is the lack of RGB. That's not to say there is no RGB, the graphics card has a little bit integrated and the motherboard has a header so you could connect up RGB LED strips if you wanted to. But wiring up LEDs is a whole extra layer of control fusion on top of building the actual core components of the computer itself. So for those of you guys who are just starting out, it's something that I would say consider leaving out of your initial build. You can add it in the future and that'll just keep things simpler, allow you to get the system put together, allow you to actually get an operating system loaded and maybe start gaming before you move on to maybe some extra aesthetic touches. That said, I think I am ready for our initial first boot. Hopefully I did everything right. That's encouraging when the fans spin up and everything. And a lot of times in my builds video, I turn the system on and I'm like, cool, it's working. I'll leave it right there. There is extra steps though, of course, the setup process, Windows installation. I also have a tutorial walkthrough video on that that you guys should also check out if you're getting your system set up for the first time. I've done a few of those actually, and I tried to be as thorough as possible and take you from this point to actually playing video games. But I think before I end this video, I wanted to specifically check one thing and that is the memory. I mentioned before that these Ryzen systems tend to work better with a little bit faster memory. 3600 speed DDR4 is what you should go for. This kit is relatively inexpensive but I was unsure if the XMP values, which are sort of the memory presets for the speeds that you can just say here, use these settings and go for it, are actually going to work. So let me see if I can get that fully functional. All right, so the graphics card's working too. We have a picture on our screen here. Our CPUs immediately recognize the 3600X up there. Like I said, there's a bunch of stuff for setup of a new system that I recommend you do. Check out my video on that. I'll put a link down in the video description. For right now, I'm gonna just try to do something really simply. And MSI puts a shortcut to it right here, which is just AXMP or enable your XMP values, switching that on. And then we will save and reset. All right, so good news and long story short, it is working. Our memory is at 1600, that's 1800 times two. Remember it's DDR, double data rate memory, and our timings are there with XMP values as well. So cool. Uh, it is functional, although I haven't done further testing with it. And I should also point out this was the Windows installation that was already on that SSD, which is a very old one from like March of this year or maybe even last year. So uh, I was just getting it sort of barely up and running so I could see that the timings had taken effect. And I must say that I am happy that it seems to be working. And guys, that is pretty much gonna wrap it up for this video. I'm very happy that this system is all put together. It's super quiet too. I don't know if you have noticed, I haven't probably made you listen very much, but can you hear that? It's always nice when you put a system together, do barely any tuning with it, and it's just quiet right out of the gates. But guys, once again, I'm gonna post links to all the hardware that I used today down in this video's description. And a reminder, once again, that this is gonna be a giveaway system that is up for grabs. We're gonna kick off the giveaway on December 7th, along with uh, me and Kyle's charity live stream. We're doing a 12 hour charity stream. We're gonna be streaming from here in the garage for 12 hours. We're gonna be streaming to twitch.tv slash awesome hardware, as well as my Twitch channel, Pulse Hardware, as well as Kyle's channel, which I forget that's like Bitwit Kai or something like that. So if you guys can make that, we'd really like you to stop by and say hello and uh, maybe do a donation if you have some spare money or if not, just enter to win this system. We're gonna have a couple other giveaway systems going on at the same time. And if any of you guys are building a system that's this system or that's derived from parts similar to this system, leave me a comment in the comment section down below or send me a tweet over on Twitter and let me know, send me a picture, tell me how it went. Lastly, if you guys wanna pick up some merch, check out my store at paulshardware.net. I've got shirts just like this one as well as a whole slew of other stuff, including infant onesies. Thanks again for watching guys and we'll see you next time.